The Trumpet Daily with Stephen Flurry. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Trumpet Daily radio show. Looks like it's going to be a, a beautiful and warm day outside for the, the last day of this uh, this work week for SEP. We're coming up to the final weekend. We had some uh, basketball games the last couple of nights, as well as uh, soccer, soccer for the girls. From what I heard, I was coaching the, the boys' basketball, so I didn't see the end of the girls' soccer but it sounded exciting, judging by the cheering as I was coming out of the field house. And so perhaps that went to a shootout. I'll find out uh, in just a bit, I suppose. Thanks to uh, Mr. Loker, Andrew Loker, for filling in yesterday at less than 100%. I don't think he was feeling the greatest, but uh, he still subbed in and did a wonderful job, judging by the, the feedback that, uh, that came in over the past 24 hours. This one here says, it was good to hear you speak, Mr. Loker. Thank you for updating us on SEP and talking about blessings and cursings. We need the constant reminder. Another one says, I also love the weather forecast that you gave. Uh, Wonderful TD today, says one listener. Grateful to God that you're here. Have a beautiful day, everyone. And then a couple more. I would have uh, loved to go to Edstone as a young person. What a privilege. And then lastly, I can't stress enough how much I enjoy this program. I'm hooked, it says. I wish my parents would have told me about the Armstrong College. We serve an awesome creator. So some excellent feedback coming in as per usual. And what a contrast, as we've been noting, what a contrast between the world of tomorrow and this is what uh, God is building The world tomorrow in embryo. It's here on this campus. It's here at this SEP program. It's here in God's church. And yet you look at the world today and the violence that just continues to spread. And it's encouraged, in fact. It's just every night you look at Andy Noe's feed and you see violence in Portland. You see these thugs surrounding this, this federal courthouse in Portland. I think uh, we might have some, some footage of this. It just goes on every day. And then the news media, they get up and pretend that these are peaceful protests. They're just peaceful protests happening. And these, these federal agents, well, they're penned in. And they're issuing these warnings, one after another. Look, we're going to send out tear gas, or we're going to... I think the the Portland mayor himself, he was with the so-called protesters. Of course, surrounded by his bodyguards. And then they had to whisk him away. It was too dangerous. That's the reality. And then the Portland mayor gets in front of the, the news cameras and says to President Trump, we don't want any troops here. And, of course, they're not even troops. They're just some agents from, I think, the, the Homeland Security Department. The president's just sending in a few agents to help investigate crime, something you would think every mayor in the United States would welcome. But, oh, no, it's all politicized. This is President Trump's militia. This is President Trump the authoritarian. They don't want help. Because it's so peaceful. That's why these government officers uh, might be permanently blinded by these attacks from the so-called peaceful protesters. I think three of them, three of them blind because of these attacks. And so the president comes out, I think it was a couple days ago, Operation Legend. He says, look, we want to send in federal law enforcement officers because federal buildings are coming under attack. And city and state officials say, no, thank you. Well, at least the mayor in Chicago seems to have backtracked a little bit. They need help. These cities need help. Richard sent me a, um, a study that found two in ten people that actually support defunding the police, something Mayor de Blasio has done. And crime there is skyrocketing as a result. But two in ten, people don't want to defund the police. Americans want to fund the police. The other day, I guess before she had a change in heart, the the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, 
She encouraged Chicagoans to call 911 if they see federal agents, as if the federal agents are the problem here. <laughs> this is what passes for leadership in America's cities today. I want to play for you a fairly lengthy clip. This is, <laughs> and I guess I should apologize for this in advance as we get to kind of peer into the mind of Mayor de Blasio. But before he speaks, the, uh, to her credit, I forget her name, she's on CNN, but she's just rattling off all of these statistics in New York City. Crime, out of control crime, violent crime. And she rattles it off, and then you'll, you'll hear Mayor de Blasio's response, his explanation for why we have skyrocketing crime statistics in New York City right now. Here's clip one. Let me just um, put up on the screen for our viewers where we are in New York in terms of violent crime. Um, shootings. The weekend of July 18th, there were 22 of them versus a year ago, there were five. The victims of those shootings, there were 44, whereas a year ago there were five victims. Then in terms of the crime stats being up, shootings are up 130% over last year. Murders are up 30%. Burglaries up 118%. Auto thefts up 51%. But then this next graph is really interesting. The NYPD arrests down. 62 percent. So just explain this paradox, Mayor, how violent crime or, all, or these other various crimes as well are up, but arrests are down. Sure, Allison. There's been a pandemic going on. I don't mean that to be flip. I, honestly, we've seen an absolute dislocation. For months, we had a lot fewer officers because they're out sick. For months, we have not had a functioning court system. NYPD has a lot of people that are ready right now to see prosecuted. Uh, but our DAs can't prosecute because there's no court system functioning yet. Uh, it's been a massive dislocation. We don't accept it. We're fighting it back. We're sending cops out to some of the neighborhoods who are having particular problems, and we're fighting back the, that crime and those shootings. But let's face it, the entire society has been through uh, just an epic dislocation. People don't have work. People don't go to school. They don't have anything. And uh, we're going to fix it. We're going to deal with it. Remember, Allison, this is a city 25 years ago going through hell with crime, and we fought our way back, and we'll fight our way through this. But we have to do it the way that works for New York City. It can't be about someone else sending in folks not trained the right way to be here who only, unfortunately, would make things worse and could lead to more violence. That's the great irony. You send in folks who are not meant for this work, and even worse things happen. So he's, he's defunding the police. He's sending police in New York City home. President Trump says, look, we'll send in some help from DHS so that we can investigate crimes. He says that makes it worse. That's going to make the problem worse. We can't do that. That makes the problem worse. What a revealing response. For one, what does it say about the side effects to a total lockdown? Something that we were noting over and over again back in March and April on this program. Okay, you're going to lock everything down. You're going to shut everything down. And what happens? Well, there he is saying we've had a pandemic. A total, an absolute dislocation. The court systems have shut down. Police are out sick. Oh, you mean when police are not available, crime goes up? It's common sense, you would think, anyway. Common sense. Still, it's all Donald Trump's fault. I saw a study, I think it was the Daily Caller, even with respect to COVID-19. New York City has been the worst region in the world as far as the mortality rate is concerned. And this study said that they would have been better off to do nothing. What they actually did made the problem worse. What they did, sending sick patients into nursing homes, it made the problem worse. And then here is Mayor de Blasio telling us about all these other problems. Look, we're in the midst of this, this absolute dislocation. We've got fewer officers. We've got no court system. Of course the crime's going to be higher. 
So what do we do? Don't take any help from the feds and keep everything locked down. How about that? That's leadership in America's cities. And then the commentators get on TV and say, well, President Trump's just targeting the blue cities, the blue states. Well, that's where the worst of the rioting is. Open your eyes. Open your eyes to see what's happening in Portland, in Chicago, in New York City. If it was happening like that in Oklahoma City, I'm sure President Trump would be sending in federal agents here as well. President Obama, by the way, he had a a chat. It was a carefully edited chat. I guess it might have been Biden's people, actually. But here, here, they're in this beautiful room, American flag in the background, and they're, they're carefully um, set apart from each other, socially distancing, all those things. And then there's comments going back and forth, and you can tell it's very carefully edited. It makes, it makes both of them look pretty smooth. But listen to what Vice President Biden, he's, of course, running for president. He wants to run the country. Listen to what he said about the Obama administration and their use of federal agents. This is clip two. We got through the notion that if a police department was engaging in a practice and a pattern that was in violation of basic civil rights and civil liberties, the Justice Department of the United States of America, the federal government, would intervene and stop it. They found problems with law enforcement. They sent in the feds, the Obama people did. Oh, Eric Holder, all of them, Loretta Lynch. In some cases, even if it was a fake crime, in come the feds, we've got to investigate. And the Democrat media complex at that time, they loved it. They loved government intervention. They loved government heavy-handedness. They love to lower the boom on these local agencies, cities, states. It didn't take anything for them to intervene, to send in federal agents. Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, in come the feds. What a difference. Here you have thugs that want to burn down the federal courthouse in Portland. President Trump wants to send in the feds. And the Democrat media complex is screaming as if this is the second coming of Adolf Hitler. He's just trying to restore order to the cities of the United States. What a revealing comment. Yet again, they open their mouth and you get some pretty good insight into the kind of government they love when they're in power. And then when they're not in power, it's victim status. Government is the bad guy. Government is the problem. We've got to destroy the system. We've got to bring down the system. It really does remind me of what happened, the the history of the Worldwide Church of God. What happened after Mr. Armstrong died, and Joe DeCotch Jr. in particular, Every every time he talked about Herbert Armstrong, it was as if it was a dictator running the Worldwide Church of God. He had absolute power. He was an authoritarian. He abused his power. And Joe DeCotch Jr., he came into that same position as the pastor general of the church. Well, first he was the assistant under his father for that period before his father died of cancer. But they used that power they decried, that authority, they said was so abusive. And they were just kicking ministers, people out of the church right and left. This is the way Satan operates. This is the way he thinks. He loves abusive government when he's in power. He loves it. But you have any kind of righteous government in place, and oh, how that presents so many problems for society, 
for churches, for nations. That's not to say that the government in the White House at present is righteous, but there certainly are some righteous steps that have been taken. Restoring order to cities that are out of control with violence you would think both political parties would be right on board with that, but not so in today's political climate. Listen to the media, the Democrat media complex, as they say, because President Trump's sent a couple hundred agents from the DHS to Chicago or New York, that because of this move, he is prepping the military for stealing the election. They believe this. They believe this, and you'll hear even from some Obama officials in this montage put together by Grabian. Here's clip three. I think we were looking at a potentially a trial run for a kind of a genuine attempt to, 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 through intimidation and potentially through force, to try to uh, to try to steal this election. If he loses, and I expect that he will, uh, we have to be prepared for things that this nation has never faced um, before. And unfortunately, that could involve the use of, uh, you know, these these forces. It has been suggested that this is a trial run by the president of the United States, who may be organizing uh, to not accept Uh, what happens when we have the election. I think we should all take very seriously the prospect that this is, as I say, a dress rehearsal, a trial run. You don't draw a line in the sand. This country may be looking down the barrel of martial law in the middle of an election. This is, I guess, the president's own version of martial law since the real military uh, has kind of pushed back from doing that. Is there anybody, having watched Donald Trump for the last three and a half years, who doesn't think that Donald Trump would try to employ martial law if he thought it was the only way he could stay in power? I ask you, Joe, is there anybody Mm -hmm. who's sensible who comes on this show who doesn't think that that's possible? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, martial law, that's what's coming. He's not going to accept the results of the election. And this is exactly what they're, (laughs) well... If you compare it to 2016, what, what, for one, what a bizarre election season this is. But then what happens after? If President Trump, and I know what the polls are saying, he's not, he's supposed to be way down and Biden is way up. He's still in the basement. He's hardly active. And evidently this is helping him, judging by the polls. There were commentators yesterday, comedians as well, calling into question President Trump's mental acuity. We'll see what happens in November. Do you think the Democrat media complex is going to accept the result if President Trump's reelected? Look at what they did last time. Look at how the Obama administration was using the feds, using government institutions, the IRS, the DOJ, the FBI, to destroy the Trump candidacy and then the Trump administration. And they're still working to do that. A lot of it's been exposed, but they still want to destroy him any way that they can. Look at what Mayor de Blasio said. How do you explain all this out-of-control crime? Well, look, we're in the midst of a lockdown. This, is, uh, this really is an absolute dislocation. These are the leaders that brought this on, this dislocation. And now you see people getting murdered. Okay, leave aside COVID-19 for a second. Murder's pretty bad too. It's skyrocketing. And that was the mayor of New York City earlier that pretty much acknowledged that, well, it's because of this lockdown. It's because of this disruption. It's because we don't have courts in place. It's because we don't have enough police officers on the streets. Going back to this this, uh, discussion that Barack Obama had 
with uh, Joe Biden. I played the clip from uh, Mr. Biden. Here's a comment that uh, Barack Obama made about something he appreciates in Joe Biden and his candidacy, clip four. Uh, and, and something that I've always admired about you, Joe, is uh, you know, your willingness to listen and learn. It is a sign of leadership when you are willing to hear other people's experiences. It has to do with communities that have systematically been underinvested in. It has to do with hiring and the fact that, you know, if you get on the phone uh, applying for a job, send in your resume. If your name is John, you might get called back. If your name's Jamal, you might not. There he is, fanning the flames. How many opportunities are there for black people in other nations compared to the United States? Fanning the flames of hatred, division, strife. He loves Joe because Joe listens to Black Lives Matter. That president, President Obama, he was inviting him into the White House. This Marxist movement. Socialism, communism, read their website as we've, as we've read before. Here the sports are finally resuming or starting back up. The NBA, it's got Black Lives Matter sprayed all over these courts. It's on jerseys. Washington Redskins had to change their name. I guess this next year they're going to be called the Washington football team. That has a nice ring to it as they try to figure out what name to use. Don't want to offend anyone. We can't offend people. That's that's rule number one, that everyone everyone must abide by this. Here again, look at polls. 29% of people think they think that the Washington Redskins should change their name. That means 71%, I presume, don't think that. I've seen stories where Native Americans, Indians themselves, they rather like the name. They like the nickname. But here they've got to change all that history. They've got to erase it. They've got to delete it. We'll talk more about that here in just a second with the second segment. I gave a a forum last week here at SCP on the, the central figure in American history. And you look at the, the rioters, you look at the protesters, this uh, central figure is someone that they want to erase. They want to remove him from American, American history. We'll get into that as I say, when we come back. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, you can send comments to td at kpcg.fm. We'll be right back. This is KPCG-FM, and this is the Trumpet Daily Jesus Christ's New Testament Church began just weeks after his crucifixion. It set to work spreading Christ's gospel message, commanding repentance and preparing for the coming kingdom of God. But immediately the gates of hell rose against it. Satan-inspired individuals, groups and governments attempted to silence the message. When that failed, the devil forged a counterfeit, a false church that claimed Jesus' name but mixed the truth with paganism and lawlessness to lead believers astray. Even more deceitfully, he infiltrated the true church with false ministers to dismantle it from the inside. To understand more about this long forgotten truth, request the true history of God's true church. To learn more, please visit thetrumpet.com.
The Trumpet Daily. Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas, he, he uh, filed a bill uh, yesterday to defund schools that are indoctrinating their children or the, the students with this 1619 project, which basically says that America as a nation was founded on the institution of slavery. And that's all you need to know, basically. We are an evil nation through and through. We haven't repented. It's still in our DNA. You heard a bit from uh, Barack Obama just, uh, just before the break. The DNA thinking. You can't remove it. It's there, generation after generation after generation. And, and good for Senator Cotton to say that, look, it, I don't know if it'll pass. It probably won't. But we ought to defund schools that get into this nonsense. Instead, we want to defund the police. What do the 1619 Project authors think about America's founding fathers? Well, just look at what the young people, the students, are out on the streets doing. Tearing down statues of these these historical figures, these towering figures of American history. We've quoted from the 20th century historian Henry Steele Commager before with respect to Winston Churchill. Listen to what he said about Thomas Jefferson. This was years ago. Commager said, Jefferson is the central figure in American history, and he may yet prove to be the central figure in modern history. Thomas Jefferson, the central figure in American history. I'm old enough to remember when President Bill Clinton, he idolized Thomas Jefferson. He fancied himself as someone cut from the same cloth. It was in June of 1776 when Thomas Jefferson crafted the United States of America's birth certificate. He wrote it. He wrote it. This was like America's SPS. This was America's specific purpose statement. This declaration of independence. He wrote it over the course of two and a half weeks in Philadelphia, June of 1776. And as we've noted here at the SEP program, this is the document. Leave aside Jefferson's sins and mistakes for a moment. This is the document that enabled the United States of America to eliminate slavery, to stamp it out, to remove it, to delete it, to blot out that sin. Maybe not all of the lingering effects, of course. Of course, there's still discrimination. Of course, there's still racism in certain parts of the world. But look at look for a moment, like we've noted on this program, at what the United States and Britain actually did to get rid of it, to remove it, to end it, to stop it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the statement. Jefferson wrote it, his most famous sentence. He wrote it, and this is the statement that those who fought later to remove or to end slavery, this is what they kept referring back to. This is what they kept pointing to. Thomas Jefferson said the, the Declaration of Independence was intended to be an expression of the American mind 
and to give to that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. Jefferson called the document the holy bond of our union. And that's the way many used to see it, almost like a religious document. It's based, after all, it's based on religious principles, biblical ideas, biblical principles. Jefferson told James Madison that he hoped Americans would always remember the Declaration and cherish its ideals. He said, I pray God that these principles may be eternal. That was Jefferson's prayer. Do Americans cherish the ideals of the Declaration of Independence? Do we cherish the freedoms enshrined in that document? Freedoms that all Americans can enjoy today. We've emphasized over and again at this SEP about working at getting better, getting better at something, developing a skill, developing a hobby, work ethic. If you do that in the United States of America, no matter what color you are, no matter what your religious background might be, if you do that, inevitably you will rise. This is the land of opportunity, even in 2020. There is no nation like the United States on earth. No nation that provides or presents as much opportunity for anyone who's willing to put forth effort, who's willing to work hard, who's willing to be educated, And let me tell you, Thomas Jefferson, this was a man obsessed with education and study. He started a university there in Virginia. This was one of the things he was most proud of in his his history, in his life. I mentioned, as I say, what presidents used to say or think about this central figure in American history. Bill Clinton, famous Democrats, even Barack Obama. Listen to what he said just six years ago. He was at Monticello, the Jefferson estate. He was with the French president. And this is what Barack Obama said in 2014, clip one. As one of our founding fathers, the person who drafted our Declaration of Independence, somebody who not only was an extraordinary political leader, but also uh, one of our great scientific and cultural leaders. Uh, Thomas Jefferson represents what's best in America. Thomas Jefferson represents what's best in America? Did he really say that just six years ago? Would he say it today? Would anyone in the Democrat media complex say it today? We played the clips for for you a couple weeks ago when President Trump had the rally uh, at Mount Rushmore and CNN and the way they covered it. Oh, how could he choose this place? Why, there's two slave owners up there. That was Barack Obama just six years ago saying that Thomas Jefferson represents what's best in America. That was Barack Obama actually taking a positive view of this history. You think about Jefferson's own words. These are inscribed on the memorial at Washington, D.C., the famous memorial that many want to take down. They want to remove it. The Jefferson Memorial. They want to cancel it. They want to delete it. And it quotes Jefferson at that memorial. He said, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. He hated tyranny. He wanted these freedoms enshrined. And eventually, the blacks in the United States of America were able to live freely in freedom as well. Because so many of these founders, they knew. They knew it was a sin and that it needed to be stamped out. 
And Abraham Lincoln had the courage and the faith to confront it, to get rid of it. This is from the the Jefferson Memorial website. It says, dedicated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's a big Democrat. That's a popular Democrat. You mean FDR actually dedicated this beautiful memorial in Washington, D.C.? Should FDR be canceled? Everybody should be canceled. If we're focusing on sin... Imagine if God thought that way. Nope, you made a mistake. You've, you've got a mistake in your past, so you've got to be canceled. Sorry. That is, that is really a demonic way to look at things. Dedicated by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1943, the Thomas Jefferson Memorial stands in a straight line with the White House Architect John Russell Pope, influenced by Jefferson's taste in classical architecture, echoed the style seen in Jefferson's two most famous buildings, Monticello and the University of Virginia Rotunda. Beautiful design. Perfectly placed in line with the White House. One of the most beautiful spots on earth. The Washington Mall, together with all of these incredible structures, should this now be canceled? Here's what it says uh, again at the memorial, quoting, I think it's quoting Jefferson. It says, can the liberties of a nation be secure? Yes, this is from Thomas Jefferson. When we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just that his justice cannot sleep forever. It says commerce between master and slave is despotism. Nothing is more certainly written in the book of fate than that these people are to be free. So they foresaw a time when that would happen. And it wasn't just something that could be done with the snap of a finger. We know what happened in the 1860s because of it. Hundreds of thousands of Americans died from the North and the South. But it was finally stamped out, that institution of slavery. President Trump, when he was at Mount Rushmore, he had a fair bit to say about Thomas Jefferson. Here's clip two. The radical view of American history is a web of lies. All perspective is removed. Every virtue is obscured. Every motive is twisted. Every fact is distorted. And every flaw is magnified until the history is purged and the record is disfigured beyond all recognition. This movement is openly attacking the legacies of every person on Mount Rushmore. They defile the memory of Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt. Today, we will set history and history's records straight. That was the president a few weeks ago over the July 4th weekend, saying that he was intent on setting the record straight Those who want to take down the Jefferson Memorial say that, well, there's not enough context there. There's context carved all over that memorial. I just read you one of the quotes. It does tell the whole story. That's American history. That's one of the founding fathers. That's the one who wrote, all men are created equal. That's a remarkable man, Thomas Jefferson, worthy of a lot of study if you have the the time. Satan wants to cancel this history. He's behind the movement. Revelation 12, you can read verses 7 through 9. My father makes the point in the Ezekiel booklet that Satan hates. He hates his own history. He wants to blot it out. 
all of the evil, all of the violence. He wants us to blot out our history. He wants us to blot out the positive. That's really what the aim is with the radical left. They're not trying to do away with the sins of America. They're trying to do away with the righteous acts. They're trying to do away with the good, the positive, the steps forward that the nation has taken. This is in The Hidden Cause of Society's Deadly Decline. This is a, a Trumpet article my father wrote in 2013. It says, he is sit- this is speaking of the devil. He's sitting on the throne of this earth, ruling this world. He's stirring up people's emotions, moods, and attitudes. When people get into a negative emotion, a bad attitude, or a wrong mood, he works on those people. He has power to influence those wrong emotions. He has deceived the world through them. It says people don't understand God's word. They don't have any depth spiritually, so they just follow along emotionally, and Satan just deceives them all. He really has a stranglehold on these these out-of-control protesters who want to destroy the system, who want, they are open, as the president said there, they are openly attacking This is not a peaceful demonstration. They are openly attacking everything that America stands for. And as I say, Satan's behind it because he knows he has a short time. Here's this quote from the Ezekiel booklet. It says, Satan's very hostile to history, and he works extremely hard to destroy it. He wants Israel to forget its history. That's us, our nation's. He wants the church to forget its history. Most of all, he's working to destroy his own history. And then he goes on to talk about how successful he's been in doing that. We put up a a map at the forum here at, at camp showing how much of the country, the United States of America, how much of it, developed just because of one purchase, the Louisiana Purchase, in 1803. Thomas Jefferson did that. Thomas Jefferson, with his presidential pen and $15 million, he doubled the size of the United States of America. How many of you listening to this program are from one of the states in the Louisiana Territory, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Of course we are. God's campus, the headquarters campus. Nebraska, the Dakotas, most of Montana, Iowa, Missouri. Thomas Jefferson had the vision to get this land when the opportunity arose. One of our listeners wrote in after I mentioned a little bit about this um, just a, a week or two ago. She said, last week you mentioned Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase. It's amazing how God works. And again, what I've noted to the campers is that when you see God, his hand in this history, that's when it gets really exciting. 1803, if you've read the United States and Britain in prophecy, you understand the significance of that date of that year. This was when God, as he promised, started just pouring blessings down upon Ephraim and Manasseh because of Abraham, not because of our own obedience, but because of Abraham, our, our forefather's obedience. And so God started to bless these United States. You see God, you see his hand in that transaction. Napoleon had the most powerful empire in the world, and yet he was basically confined to the European continent. He wanted to expand his empire into Britain, but he couldn't. And then Nelson devastated his navy in 1805. There's another significant time or date 
Right around the same time, the United States is gobbling up all of this land from Napoleon. He wanted, he wanted to expand his empire into the Americas as well. But things went bad for him in Haiti. And he was, he was in, need, in desperate need of money. And so he went ahead and gave us the Louisiana Territory for $15 million. This listener writes, It's amazing how God works, giving us even more than we ask for. She says, when you study history, you find out so many interesting facts. I read a book several years years ago about the Louisiana Purchase in which Jefferson had sent emissaries to Napoleon after that, uh, that Frenchman had gotten Spain's territory on the North American continent. It changed hands there right before Napoleon got it. Spain, I think, gave it to Napoleon on the condition that he wouldn't sell it to anyone, which, of course, he did. But it says here, concerned about being able to continue to do shipping down the Mississippi through the port of New Orleans, Thomas Jefferson was asking only for free use of the port of New Orleans. That's the way that it started. Well, we've got to we've got to somehow be able to use this port because otherwise it's going to be a big threat for the United States whether it's coming in from France or Spain or whoever. So they wanted to secure the port. And then later to purchase the port, the the port around New Orleans. This crucial waterway, the Seagate. It says Napoleon was in need of money to finance his wars in Europe and immediately offered to sell all those newly gained territories to the United States. The emissaries Jefferson sent didn't have time to contact him. They took that marvelous offer immediately. So in 1803, God's promised prophecy to Abraham and Israel was fulfilled. God had given us more than what we asked for, much more. She went on to say, using another example, She talked about some relatively recent church history. The lawsuit over Mystery of the Ages from 1997 through to 2003. And how that we went into that just looking to get the free use of Mystery of the Ages. We didn't really even care about the copyright or what the copyright said. We just argued in court that, look, they're trying to bury this material. And according to the law of the land, people should have the free use, or they should be freely allowed to at least read this book. And we'll print it. We'll put whatever you want on the copyright notice. That's what we asked for. And in the end, we got much more than what we asked for. We own Mystery of the Ages. We own the incredible human potential. We own the missing dimension in sex. We own the United States and Britain in prophecy. The correspondence course, the autobiographies, all the booklets. So much more than what we even asked for. Genesis 35 and verse 11, coming back to these promises God made to Abraham and his descendants. It says, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of you, and kings shall come out of your loins. A nation, the single greatest superpower in world history, and a company of nations, that's an empire. The British Empire and the United States of America So here's Napoleon in the late 1700s, early 1800s. He's just going on this rampage across Europe. This is the fifth resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. That too was prophesied. And yet he could not, he could not overtake the power of the British Navy on the seas. And so Britain was saved and he could not expand his empire into North America And so the fledgling nation of the United States doubled overnight, doubled in size, 
And of course, this time period coincided with so many of those other famous expeditions, Lewis and Clark. That too was an outgrowth of the Thomas Jefferson presidency. So is this man, this founding father, this central figure in, in U.S. history, is he worthy of our study? Is he worthy of our admiration? He certainly is. He certainly is. This is from Dumas Malone's book, Jefferson the President. It says this, speaking of the Louisiana Purchase, it says this epic-making agreement with France was owing to a concurrence of extraordinarily fortunate circumstances. Fortunate, that is, from the American point of view. <laughs> this is the way historians view it. Whoa, how lucky! How lucky we were! How fortunate we were! In fact, God's hand is all over this. And that's the point. God used these men. God used these men. They had profound minds. They had a respect for their creator, for their maker, and for the Holy Bible. And they drew attention to it all the time. Maybe not Jefferson as much as others, but he certainly did draw attention to his creator, providence, and so on. He said his prayer was that people would cherish the ideals of the Declaration. It's amazing history. That's what the devil wants to blot out. That's what he wants to blot out. Here's a bit, a bit more about the purchase. It says, Before the United States could establish fixed boundaries to Louisiana, there arose a basic question concerning the constitutionality of the purchase. Did the Constitution of the U.S. provide for an act of this kind? The president, in principle, a strict constructionist, thought uh, an amendment to the Constitution might be required to legalize the transaction. But... After due consideration and considerable oratory, the Senate approved the treaty by a vote of 24 to 7. See, Jefferson himself, he wasn't even sure if it was constitutionally allowed. But he had the vision from sea to shining sea. This is of God. Overnight, the United States doubled in size. Jefferson knew, well, look, if Congress is on board, we've got to snatch this up. This is the opportunity of a lifetime. Notice what Herbert Armstrong wrote in 1984. He said, until 1800, these nations had been small and unimportant. Speaking of U.S. and Britain, uh, they had been small and unimportant in the world. But suddenly, in AD 1800, London became the financial capital of the world. The United States had been 13 original colonies with a few territories added. In 1803, the Louisiana Purchase was acquired from France, and the United States almost suddenly sprouted up into, by 1918, the greatest, wealthiest, and most powerful nation on earth. Just a little over a century later, Hopefully we have time for this last clip. Here's President uh, Trump at Mount Rushmore, clip uh, three. Jefferson, the great Thomas Jefferson, was 33 years old when he traveled north to Pennsylvania and brilliantly authored one of the greatest treasures of human history, the Declaration of Independence. He also drafted Virginia's Constitution and conceived and wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, a model for our cherished First Amendment. After serving as the first Secretary of State and then Vice President, he was elected to the presidency. He ordered American warriors to crush Barbary pirates, he doubled the size of our nation with the Louisiana Purchase. And he sent the famous explorers Lewis and Clark into the West on a daring expedition to the Pacific Ocean. He was an architect, an inventor, a diplomat, a scholar, the founder of one of the world's great universities. 
and an ardent defender of liberty. Americans will forever admire the author of American freedom, Thomas Jefferson. And he, too, will never, ever be abandoned by us. Pretty good summation there, or summary, from President Trump just a couple weeks ago about this remarkable man, the central figure in American history. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. If you'd like to email the program, send comments to td at kpcg.fm. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you tomorrow.